Okay then guys, so thank you very much anyway uh, for um, having me this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about the tech and tactile approach that I use and I'm going to put a spin on it in terms of reflecting on this as a way of offering sustainable innovation in the higher education classroom. And um, It's been lovely in terms of following some fantastic acts this afternoon. I've had the privilege of following them and of course with that previous presentation I certainly loved my PGCHPE qualification, got an awful lot of relevant research which has indeed informed this approach which I'm going to be sharing with you so you'll just never know where those qualifications take you and those small scale studies can actually become the cornerstone of your pedagogy so it was fascinating to follow on from that. For those of you that aren't familiar with me my name is Fran Brown Cornwall I'm a lecturer in the Institute of Education here at Staffordshire University. I currently lead the special educational needs and disabilities pathway for our BA Honours Early Childhood Studies and BA Honours Education Studies students. I'm also the early years consultant for our university's multi academy trust and an innovator for the Staffordshire Centre for Learning and Pedagogic Practice, which is shortened to SCOL. Uh, I'm also a hybrid education and psychology researcher and I'm currently investigating higher order thinking and the smile and laughter response in two year old children. And you'll notice that actually all of that from my introduction um, will sort of come together all of those elements of my professional identity collide in the pedagogy which I'm about to share. Um, so I'm going to share with you what I refer to as my cornerstone of my own pedagogy and I use this whether I'm working with two-year-old children or 22-year-old adults or older. Um, you know, I myself just so happen to be a young and hip and happening 21-year-old. It doesn't matter that I was actually born in the 80s. You know, it's regardless of age or phase of education a learner or indeed lecturer finds themselves in, I have managed to have a trifle lot of success with this tech and tactile approach. So hopefully as I cover this this, this afternoon you can perhaps take some practical things you may wish to try amend or indeed discard sometimes it's helpful to hear what you definitely wouldn't do you know so absolutely no issues if, if you don't feel like you can take any of this on board neither but hopefully you do find something of value so the origin then, I'm going to take a bit of a story if you like, but the origin of the tech and tactile approach actually came from a few years back when I was in my earlier career of being a lecturer, about 2016 time, round right about then. Um, and I was, um, I adopted a set of students if you like, it happens doesn't it, life happens. And these particular students were requesting more group work. And I just so happened to be working in a partnership provider where the classroom overhead projector, so that primary display screen, um, was was dying its death. It was on its last legs. It was really, really difficult to see. So I'd got used to really planning for no primary display in the classroom. This was becoming commonplace practice, to be honest. And actually their feedback requesting more um, group work was an excellent solution, I thought. Um, now, some folks might recoil in horror at the thought of having no primary display screen for all the learners to look at during their lesson or delivery. Um, but I'm also really mindful that if we carry on relying on that front screen at the front and us at the front, it just plays into the hands of, you know, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I might remember territory of teaching. Um, and I think we've probably all been there or at least witnessed when a screen isn't working in a classroom and suddenly there's a real issue on hand, you know, there's a bit of a flap at the front, sometimes lessons don't get going until the tech gurus have visited the location. But actually, this is a bit of a shame because we're relying on tell the students and show the students so heavily. Are we really involving the students if once that primary display screen is gone that we've got no lesson virtually? So my first recommendation, if you do want to adopt the tech and tactile approach, is to get rid of that front screen and see what happens to your session and what workarounds you come up with, which it's likely like me, the session will become immersive in different ways. But anyway, I've got to go back to my little story about those students I adopted wanting more group work um, and, you know, that poor screen that we got. I got to work really thinking about the resources which we always had in the classroom. So some might be loose parts which are in the environment, such as bottles, pens, things like that. And others might indeed be the technological stuff, you know, students, personal phones, laptops, the stuff that they bring with them tech wise and physical stuff that they bring with them. Um, so to engage them in a reading task, now that is transferable across whatever subject you're teaching, I set up an online and concurrent in-person scavenger hunt. Now back in 2016, this was pretty innovative, 
it's commonplace now, I'm sure, but students had to access different credible items of literature, answer questions and fulfil tasks by completing team challenges, which in turn, it scored them some points and got them actually reading the sources I wanted them to read. So the initial tasks that they were set during this scavenger hunt were for fun first, just to get them used to it. So, for example, the first one was to take a team selfie with their coffee cups and upload it. And then this progressed in difficulty. So they then had to locate a certain chapter and summarise a theory. So, you know, goodbye, referencing Wikipedia, referencing business balls and about.com and hello books and journals, which was a real, real winner. So the merge of physical and digital for this example was largely to do with where the literature was located. So some was in the class, some was in Blackboard, which is their virtual learning environment at the time and also how they were submitting their answers to these tasks. On this occasion, I use the Goose Chase app, I use a freebie, and I'm sure there'll be freebies out there which you could use as well, which Goose Chase is an online scavenger hunt, but there's many more. It was just the one that I used uh, for this particular task. And the other way it was merged was in how students themselves chose their own entry points into accessing the materials. So they worked in collaboration with each other to make decisions about how and what they learnt. So students said during this activity, ad hoc and unprovoked, I didn't necessarily ask, um, wow, I love learning like this, which is lovely to hear, of course. And then I also had the comments of, I hate technology. <laughs> Always one, isn't there? Um, but I like disseminating the tech work to those girls whilst I read this book. Perfect. Lovely, nice mix, combination. And I just heard in the, the presentation before me, those Kagan structures works beautifully with those. If you're not familiar with the Kagan structures, do a quick search for it. Um, I think you'll find them amazing for your classroom. So I reflected on this session and developed a consistent approach to using merging the tech and the tactile and I was subsequently awarded an internal teaching excellence fellowship which enabled me to then share the evolution of this pedagogic concept and approach and thus the tech and tactile approach was born. So you'll have noticed in the nauseating slide that you've got in front of you a little gif of some of the examples and it's sometimes just nice to have a window into somebody else's classroom isn't it so the things which are flashing in front of you there are going to be described a little bit later on um but one or two of them included doing art activities both online and offline during the pandemic i asked students to create uh, who's under the mask uh, and they could create that either digitally or physically and then we were on team sharing those descriptions and so on. Um, there's another one which I'll go into detail in uh, more uh, a little bit later and then there's some which look like board games and students were creating board games to uh, create revision materials for child development theories and child development milestones and some of them chose physical, some of them created digital and they went and used them in their own revision time as well. So th those are what are currently making you feel quite sick on the slide um, but we'll go into some more examples of tech and tactile in practice as this progresses but I'm sure you're all itching to know <laughs> what the theoretical and pedagogical underpinning of this actually is. So off the back of that story of the one session, which was the online and physical scavenger hunt, as an entire cornerstone of what my approach is, well, what actually is that? What is tech and tactile? So the tech and tactile approach is implemented via a cyclical planning and taxonomy of progressive learning. So my industry experience is in the early childhood sector prior to higher education, and we often use this cyclical approach to planning, and I've applied this in the higher education classroom. So students have tech and tactile activities running concurrently with each other or sequentially, whereby each physical aspect of the activity has a digital counterpart and vice versa. So activities which encourage memory, secure understanding and applications practice are implemented before activities that elicit those more difficult skills such as analysis, evaluation and creativity from the students. Now, this is important for both the subject material and the students digital literacy. Um, so the digital tools and the subject matter begin with familiar concepts and technologies before becoming increasingly complex. So the tech and tactile approach is applied via me and my reflexive practice and consistently reflecting on whether physical embodiment of learning is being accounted for and if the co-activation of students' cognitive abilities, their intellect, 
their physical perception and motor gross motor movement during learning um, is elicited in both the physical and the di digital arenas. So the pedagogic perspective underpinning the tech and tactile approach is influenced by Bloom 1956 taxonomy of learning and Church's 2018 digital taxonomy, which ensures that the content and the difficulty progresses in a nice linear fashion. We know learning isn't linear, but at least if we're not slamming them with difficult stuff first, we're going easy and easing them into this experience, it's likely to be more successful. And this is also incredibly important for the theoretical perspective and the, the psychology which influences me with this approach. Um, so it's lifespan theory of maturation by Boltz and, and other researchers, um, which really influences why I do this. So our learners are traditionally in early to late adulthood by the time they head into higher education. And we know from research that these kinds of learners require tacit experiences which are memorable and relevant to their own personal um, career goals. So the tech and tactile approach is informed by that and of course psychology research into perceptual motor research which explores that relationship we all have between our intellect, our physical movement, our emotional feelings whilst we are learning. And this is particularly important because it's that is most successfully achieved when students are engaged in multimodal experiences. So if we're wanting to elicit a physical, emotional and intellectual response from them, we need to be doing this in multimodal experiences rather than 2D experiences, which is quite profound. The reality is, as educators in higher education, though, we have no choice but to work with students, taking into account them as a whole person, you know, with sensory experiences, perceptions and their intelligence. Because well before we meet them, our students' limbic system, so what's going on in their brain, has been set. That thermostat, that thermostat for how our, le our students learn was set around about two years old, believe it or not. So their higher order thinking skills are based on when previous experiences in their lives have evoked intellectual uh, cognition, emotion, socialising simultaneously. So we need to work with this to maximise on what they do well already, whilst increasing their capabilities. So all of our students have the capacity to remember, to apply and analyse and create, but they'll all sit somewhere different in terms of their capacity to use these skills. So to make um, them excellent creators and, and, and etc, we need to um, help evolve their higher order thinking. And we can't do that. Neuroscience tells us we actually can't do that without co-activating their thoughts, their body and emotions concurrently. And as we say, a lot of that happened in the early years. So we need to maximise on what's going on in their brains just now. And to go back to that little story where we, if we're relying on that front screen where it's tell me, show me, that is something that the, that offering doesn't offer. It doesn't elicit emotions, physicality and intellectual stimulation when we're just showing and telling. We need to provide something that is a little bit different. So hopefully it makes sense in terms of where all of my uh, industry experience, research, etc. collides in the cornerstone of my practice. So what might this actually look like in practice? So I'll share with you um, three favourites as chosen by the students themselves. Um, but I would like you to reflect whilst you're listening to me garble on about whether or not you feel these experiences are just novelty, novelty things to have in the classroom, or if you think they are sincere innovation. Um, so yeah, have a little think uh, as, as you hear me talk now. So. The first one that you can see is where my students as early childhood study students were producing sensory experiences for toddlers and these students were taking into account toddlers that may have sensory aversions. Um, so we looked at things such as cloud dough, which is made by either um, hair conditioner or baby oil and plain flour and that's all that's in it. We also looked at clean painting, so it's paint inside a press stud um, plastic bag so there's nothing that actually physically gets on the hands but it's all the loveliness of creating an image and we looked at squishy bags as well so we could put different kinds of sensory items shiny things squishy things different textures etc but again behind that plastic covering um, so anybody with a sensory aversion didn't need to go there if they didn't fancy that and what the students did in terms of that digital arena was think about how these experiences could be amplified with toddler apps, 
Now, there are so many apps that are useful for 12 to 16 month olds now exploring different concepts, even VR and virtual reality, little scan things on top of things. You know, you can get a little um, gingerbread man running through the classroom if you so wish. There's so many amazing things that early childhood apps allow for which unfortunately you know tablets and apps get vilified in the media a little bit but when used effectively they can really champion some amazing sensory experiences for even our smallest of learners so the students had these physical activities going on and then they searched for some apps which would amplify this experience and take it into a digital realm so they could role model positive use of technology as well and also find out some useful stuff uh, for parents and of course you use these activities in practice the second image which is popped up there on your slide and an example from practice is from a level five module called collaborative working and again this is looked at by early childhood study students in collaborative working the end point assessment encourages students to work in a team to reflect on their teamwork and share examples from the real world and industry when they have engaged in teamwork so this is a task where the students say that's the point in the module they felt like they really got the assessment so anything that can currently help them support you know assessments is, is ideal in, in my book but in this particular task, the students walk into a room that looks like a bomb has actually hit it. There's just loose parts, craft materials absolutely everywhere with just a little QR code sat on the top. And in their teams, they have to scan the QR code, which then takes them to their mission impossible task. They then follow the instructions in their mission impossible task, which for the example on the slide might be recycle an item of clothing into a new resource. And in that digital environment, there's a series of questions that helps them to reflect on how they've worked as a team. What is it that they've produced? Any theories of teamwork and leadership that resonate with the experience that they're having? And at the end of the session, they share with the group what it is that they've produced and their reflections um, on the, the theory and the teamwork, et cetera, that has gone concurrently with that. And, and this can happen in both the physical and the digital environment. I have had hybrid learners not necessarily in person with the classroom involved in this, and they've still been able to get involved in asking those tasks um, and sharing their version of the creations that they've got up to in their own spaces. So it is really quite translatable. And this final one then, the third one, um, this like the image that's popped up there for you, is an activity which encouraged learners to reflect on their observation skills. So we were looking at how senses can very easily be tricked. So students in the physical environment were smelling, tasting, touching, and really thinking how, oh, okay, senses are so easily tricked. If I smell something and I think it's something, but it's actually something else, then we were really exploring how observation can be influenced by all sorts of different things in the environment. And they had real experiential experience of that. In the online environment, which I'm sure you're thinking, how on earth can you recreate that online? I had produced a Microsoft OneNote and in there, there were all sorts of different visual and optical illusions and so on. So they could also, if they were if they were averse to those sensory experiences or indeed they had allergies, that they could go into that digital environment as well and trick their senses in the same way. Now, what happened here was quite fascinating. We went from beyond exploring our five senses, what we rely on in observation of children in education, and we started to think about that debated sixth sense of proprioception, which actually in terms of our neurodivergent learners, proprioception is a key aspect. So the learning that took place as a result of this was fascinating. And in terms of digital skills, those which were perhaps averse or didn't fancy going on to one, Microsoft OneNote, actually went in there their curiosity got the better of them they went and used a bit of software they wouldn't normally use simply because they thought how on earth can my senses be tricked online oh there we go it's been done and um, so those are some ex examples of tech and tactile in real time with my students so again have a little think about whether you feel that that is novelty or innovation but I'll throw this into the ring. I don't think it's either of those. I think it's absolutely necessary that we start to engage in learning experiences such as this. So much of the tech and tactile activities that occur in the classroom use loose and or recyclable parts already in the environment, what would typically be referred to as landfill. All right. Um, so it's thinking about how we can use these, recycle them and repurpose them for new, meaningful and immersive activities in the classroom. I was recently looking through my uh, 
office and I found these um, polystyrene cups. Well, polystyrene in terms of sustainability in the environment, whoa, no, we, don't want it. we don't want those. But a colleague put my mind to rest and said, look, they are in the environment now. Let's just find a different use and, and, and work with that. And I thought that is a really pragmatic approach to that. There is stuff in this environment that's absolutely no good for Mother Nature, but we might as well just use it, recycle it, repurpose it. And I think education has got a part to play in that. It's absolutely necessary for quality education, the global sustainable goals, that we start to play our part in doing all of that. So the tech and tactile approach allows you to scoop up some of that landfill and use it in meaningful ways for our students. I also, and I'm very aware of bringing this up in a, a digital uh, webinar, but I also very keen on the, the situation with digital poverty, particularly here in the UK, that not all provisions or individual learners can access top software, top hardware, or the latest trends. So actually working with readily available products, which don't actually cost that much, and products that can do a hell of a lot more than we sometimes think. So Microsoft Forms is fantastic for recreating role play I've used it for. Uh, Microsoft OneNote is amazing for creating online digital escape rooms, which I've used before. Um, Microsoft Teams, you can do simple simulation in there. So we don't always have to go with high um, brow, super expensive stuff. Actually, we can be pleasant with our partner providers or other people that want to replicate our pedagogy that might not necessarily have that digital highbrow kind of kit and software that they feel that they might need when actually they don't. Real innovation comes with working with what you've got. Uh, and I can, if you refer to me as an eggbox teacher, egg box teacher, you could get a lesson out of an eggbox, then so be it. I absolutely can, but I'll be sure to innovate with that as well. So I was really conscious of that digital poverty. It's surprising how many students as well rock up with their phone because that is their main source of, you know, um, tech. Regardless of having laptop loan schemes and things like that, sometimes people are just the stigma attached to needing that can, can be enough to put them off. So actually using innovation in terms of software, which is readily available like Microsoft Word and the Microsoft suite of um, um, items is, is, is enough. You can really innovate with that. I also think about the sustainability of us <laughs> as higher education, professional services, academics and everybody in between. You know, it is a labour intensive environment just now. It is high pressure. The workloads are monumental. Delivery can be intensive. It can be labour intensive. So can we keep it up? Do we need to change in response to what the landscape of higher education actually is? So thinking about our own sustainability, we're humans, you know, and actually adding those experiences where the students are creating, exploring and they're doing that legwork. They're finding stuff out, which is fantastic learning and so equitable between us and them that actually it might just sustain things a little bit more for us personally as well. I've also found that um, the tech and tactile approach can be accessible and implementable anywhere. As that opening story alluded to, a room with really low tech, it was still manageable there. Equally, we've got a fantastic building here at Stafford University, really privileged to have the, you know, award-winning catalyst building there. I've been able to apply it there and I've also been able to apply tech and tactile out on our nature reserve as well. Take a couple of QR codes, etc. Boom, you've got the digital environment open up whilst you're making a den in that forest school environment. So it, you can pick up this and pop it wherever you like. I've also had colleagues who have adopted some of these approaches in um, subject areas not to do with education or early childhood studies and have seen some lovely success. So I did research this, um, you'll be pleased to know, this isn't just, uh, you know, theory according to Fran, and some of the impact which I discovered is as follows, but I'd like to highlight equity as being one of the things I'm really, really passionate about, it being an impact here. So my initial research investigating the tech and tactile approach, it was practitioner based, and it was following a narrative and naturalistic approach. The participants initially simply included 98 students studying the BA at Early Childhood Studies and Early Years Teacher Status courses, and these students are levels four through to seven, both part-time and full-time routes. The raw data combined examples from practice, my personal reflections, student feedback and student case studies, and it was analysed using the reflexive thematic analysis approach by Braun and Clark 2015. Now, these findings revealed that the approach had a self-referent and transferable nature. Um, it provided choice and it avoided sedentary learning. And it also elicited art, design and production, which were all important for the students. So they self-referred as important factors for their learning experience. 
Students saw value in the tech and tactile approach to their own study and professional goals. So they identified explicit examples of them applying the tech and tactile approach in their own workplaces and study time. So one of those students became alumni and actually did some teaching in a partner college. They have applied this in their setting and got some lovely feedback. Another student in their own revision time actually recreated some of the activities in their own bedroom. They had a giggle about it, but it worked for them. So why not? And I, I thought this was really great, really positive. And actually, though, when I drilled down into the influence that the tech and tactile approach has had on individual module performance since implementing and sustaining its approach, I don't think I was prepared for the impact on equity that I think it has had. Now, you know, I appreciate there are many variables beyond just the cornerstone of my pedagogy that could, of course, influence these findings. Um, but I think anything that may have indeed influenced equity of learning, it just can't be ignored. We need to maximise on that, going back to the sustainability goals, but equally just equity of the human experience. So when I looked at a module which is long standing and I've sustained delivering this for well since 2016 maybe even before that I looked at how many students I had personally taught using this approach and it equated to 601 students 117 of these students identified themselves within the Bain communities and please forgive me I know that is becoming an outdated term but higher education seems to continue to use it to analyze widening participation um, 304 of them fell within that widening participation demographic due to caring responsibilities, commuting or living in an area of high deprivation, um, or they were first generation higher education learners. And 152 of those disclosed a disability as well. So there's quite a lot within that 601, which you could argue have got these barriers to higher education. But when the tech and tactile approach has then been used across this sustained period, I've been able to uh, quantify some of this and noted that there'd been a median achievement rate of 63% gaining a 2-1, 98% um, progression and module feedback uh, was consistently above 90% satisfaction. So if the tech and tactile approach has got any influence on the success of that particular module beyond the research which I'd already done, I just think it needs to be maximised upon. So for me, my next step is to investigate the equity and the sustainability of using the tech and tactile approach as a unique or signature pedagogy that could be picked up beyond myself. So in terms of what's next for you or how about you and how you might wish to apply this in practice, my call to action would be potentially to make some swaps. So make some environmentally friendly swaps, such as turning the screens off just to see what happens. You've got no primary screen anymore. Uh, try applying potentially that cyclical approach to planning, uh, which is just there on the slide. Um, or even just asking yourself some reflective questions about your teaching methods. You know, how are you co-activating cognitive and intellectual abilities, student perceptions and movement. How much are students using their emotions, physicality and intellect in your room? How often are we explicitly eliciting that in our activities, both physical and digital arenas? Um, so, yeah, some interesting things that we can do to be able to apply the tech and tactile approach in practice. You know, small, small little swaps or, you know, it could indeed be a cornerstone, you know, such as I've adopted it. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect anybody to suddenly think, right, OK, down, down in tools and how I usually teach, I'm going to do this. Absolutely not. But there are some swaps that we can do to perhaps have the same impact, which I've experienced using this tech and tactile approach. So that's my call to action for you. Try some simple swaps, maybe some some reflective questions or indeed a different cyclical approach to your planning of future activities. So that's it from me. That was a whistle stop tour of my tech and tactile approach, uh, its impact and its you know potential repercussions for sustainability and equity. Uh, it's just left for me to really thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to open up for conversation if there's still time George. <laughs>